This is a podcast from the British Library. For more information, visit www.bl.uk forward slash podcast. Good evening and welcome back to our final session of the day. In May 1957, Harold Pinter's first play for the theatre was performed in a disused squash court uh, by students at Bristol University, and some of whom are here tonight. Although performed over just two days, the room did not pass unnoticed in Bristol. The local press hailed the unknown writer, while the Bristol Evening Post, uh, while the reviewer for the Bristol Evening Post, rather presciently noted that Mr. Pinter may well make some impact as a writer. <laughs> 51 years on, I think we can all agree that our unknown Evening Post reviewer got it just about right. That impact has included writing some of the most celebrated and significant plays of the 20th century, as well as work in poetry and the cinema, and has included a wide range of honours, uh, culminating in the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2005. As Head of Modern Literary Manuscripts at the Library, I'm very pleased to welcome Harold to our conference. Both Harold and Lady Antonia have been wonderful champions for the Library over many years, and we're very grateful to both of them for their support. As many of you, I'm sure, will know, the archives of Harold Pinter and Lady Antonia Fraser were added to our permanent collections uh, late last year, less than a year ago. And some highlights of the Pinter archive are on display in our theatre exhibition over in the main building, including original drafts and letters from Samuel Beckett and Noel Coward. I'm now going to hand over to Harry Burton, Harry, who's collaborated with Harold Pinter, both in the theatre and on the cricket pitch, has very kindly agreed to chair tonight's event. Harry. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Jamie. It's, uh, it's an honour to, uh, to be with Harold uh, this evening and um, uh, to be reflecting on this golden generation um, but at least we're going to begin there. Um, downstairs, there's a wonderful framed page one of, of Harold's manuscript of the homecoming and um, these extraordinary artifacts, the, the, the white gloves of Sir Lawrence Olivier from The Entertainer. And uh, it's just extraordinary to see these things collected and one suddenly becomes aware of, truly of history, it seems to me. Um, and... As Jamie said, the, the history of your plays, Harold, begins uh, in a squash court of all places, a converted squash court in Bristol um, with your lifelong friend, Henry Wolfe, as director, producer, and actor in this play called The Room. Uh, I, I, one of the things about uh, The Room is that Henry Wolfe played the same part that he played as a 26-year-old 50 years later at the Almeida. There can't be many parts in the theatre that have been played by the same actor uh, so many years apart. Uh, but I'm delighted to say that we can, we're going to show, very, very briefly, show a clip uh, of The Room from a film that Harold and I made together for Channel 4 a couple of years ago, uh, because we thought it would be fun to uh, bring The Room alive and, uh, and just show also in the clip, a couple of stills of that set, that original set from the Bristol production in that squash court. So if we could roll Savan the, uh, the clip, that would, be, that would be very good. Well, it's a kid, I must say, this is a very nice room. It's a very comfortable room. Best room in the house. It must get a bit damp downstairs. Not as bad as upstairs. What about downstairs? Uh, what about downstairs? What about? It must get a bit damp. A bit. Not as bad as upstairs, though. No one had ever seen a play like that before, with those pauses, with those non sequiturs. How many floors you got in this house, Mr. Kidd? Floors? Oh, we had a good view of them in the old days. How many have you got now? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't count them now. One of the great things that he's not given credit for is he realised that conversation between people, dialogue, is not for the exchange of information or emotions or whatever. 
unless it's very simple, more sugar, please. It's most often to defend oneself, to defend one's status or one's purpose or to attack somebody else in some way to define one's right in the territory one inhabits. I went to see the production. I'd never, naturally never seen a play of mine on the stage because I hadn't written one. So I got totally drunk. Um, I mean, absolutely, as drunk as you've ever been in your life. I was really clearly quite excited. I was 26 at the time, and, um, and still am in many ways, by the way. And I, um, I got so drunk that, I, that Henry had to take me back to my, our boarding house um, where my, my wife opened the door wearing a black cloak, I remember, over a nightdress, <laughs> and said, bring him in. <laughs> and Henry just threw me on the bed and left hastily. And the next day we had to go to Malvern with a most appalling hangover and um, act whatever the hell the play was. A few years ago, I was in Bristol, went to the uh, theatre, which is now a storeroom of some kind. Oh, yeah, it was the old squash court. Yes, it was an old squash court, became a little theatre. Mm. It's now a storeroom. And I was very moved to be there, to stand there yeah. and remember yes. that, you know, the, our history. Thank you. I, I hope you could hear the sound was a bit strange on the stage, but I hope you could hear clearly uh, what was being said there. So Henry, um, Henry was one of a, of a, of a group of, of young men that you grew up with from, from school and then continued to, to stay in touch with. H how important has that hackney uh, comradeship been for you over the years? Oh, well, very, very important. Um, I have three friends, um, one in Australia and two in Canada, and we're all um, the, roughly the same age, which is getting on a bit now, and, um, and we, we, we keep in correspondence and, um, and telephone calls, and, um, and we, we see each other occasionally. Um, but you're quite spread globally, aren't you? Well, yes, but um, they, they come over. They did. And I once or twice went to Canada. I've never been to Australia. Um, but we're very, very close. And it was a, a intellectually very stimulating beginning to our lives, really. Um, the four of us. Well, there were more than four, actually. A couple more, two of them have died. And, um, and the rest are still alive, amazingly, including me. So um, it, it's always meant a great deal to me. I mean, the, uh, the odd thing in my life, odd, it's not odd, it's the wrong word, uh, is that um, I, uh, about a month ago, my very close friend, Simon Gray, died quite suddenly. And um, I'd known him for 38 years uh, and directed nine of his plays. And it was a great, great shock and, and remains so. Um, I don't know, one doesn't know what to do about it, really. But the other lot, are all about 78, uh, are still there. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Simon because uh, I also wanted to um, mention him. I, I don't think it's possible to, in, in reflecting on the last 50 years of theatre and so on in, in this country, not to think about Simon Gray. Um, and that amazing collaboration, I mean, that is one of the most extraordinary bodies of work between Harold and Simon Gray, it seems to me. Uh, I, I don't want to be silly and ask you for a favourite, but... Of those nine plays, can you pick one or two out that, that gave you a special uh, challenges and, and excitement? Well, they were all, they were all great to do, actually. With, with one exception, which was the Colin Pursuit, 
um, you know, I'd given up smoking exactly when we went into rehearsal, which nearly killed me, it nearly killed the actors too. And um, <laughs> Simon Gray never did give up smoking. Uh, but that made it very difficult. Apart from that, it was um, a, a wonderful, um, the whole thing, 38 years of, of doing his plays. I uh, always probably loved Quartermain's terms the most. I just think it was an exquisite piece of work. Uh, it was very difficult to distinguish between one and, and another. How did you meet? Well, I was offered to direct Quartermain's Terms, 1970, by Michael Cottrell, the producer. But how did you and Simon meet originally? How, was, how, how we were you? We met then. But you directed the film of Butley much earlier than that. No, no, not at all. Ah. No. I beg your pardon. <laughs> I directed the film of Butley much later. Yeah. I did Butley first. Are you talking about Quartermain? What are we talking about? Here? I'm asking you, when you first met Simon Gray, and how when, did you first come to meet Simon? When Michael Codron brought Simon along to meet me. Uh, when I, in 1970, he sent me Butley, the play, and I'd said, yes, I would love to direct it. And then I met Simon at that point. Um, and of course, I mean, it was not only Simon, incidentally, but we shared a great relationship with Alan Bates, mm. um, who was a wonderful actor and was brilliant in, in Butley, in fact. Uh, so I had a very rich um, association with Simon and, in fact, Alan over the years. They're both... Both gone now. So the room was part of a, a, an extraordinary uh, 18 months for you that, that also saw the birthday party and the, the dumb waiter was uh, around at that time, first produced in Germany, and then uh, as part of a double bill at the Royal Court. Um, the birthday party, I believe, I mean, I think everyone knows about um, the, the lyric, Hammersmith production and Harold Hobson's extraordinary public statement of support for you. But there was a, a second production, if I'm right, um, that Stephen Joseph produced in, at Scarborough that Alan Aikborn acted in. I directed him. Which had a different director, I was going to say. <laughs> um, and um, it seems to me that it's possibly quite significant, not to say that the first director was, was a fool, but that something happened between those two quite close together productions. Some, some ha thing happened. The Guardian certainly uh, changed its mind about, your, about the play and publicly said, we got this wrong the first time because they saw your production. And I remember uh, someone told me earlier that uh, Alan Aikborn said he, that they came off stage after the first night. Some of the actors not at all sure really about what they were doing still, but they came off and with the audience's response in their minds, they looked at you in astonishment, he said. Who did? Aikborn. In other words, that you, that, that you had guided them to uh, a, a realization of that play that had clearly not happened the first time around. The play was the same, let's f face it, both times. The play has never changed. <laughs> so, uh, what... And I did say to Alan Aikborn when I, uh, rather, when I had, went to the first rehearsal, this is sto a story he tells, and uh, I'm not sure that it's accurate, but he tells it now, and... Um, it, it's worth repeating because it's a good story, whether it's true or not. <laughs> but he said um, to me, can I ask you a question? I said, what? And he said, um, who am I? Where do, where do I come from? Who are my parents? Did I go to school? Where? What kind of job did I have before I came down to this seaside town and so on and so on? And he said, I said, mind your own bloody business. <laughs> <laughs> Just say the lines. Right. I can't believe I said such a thing. 
but still. Well, some of us have read that story with an expletive in the place of the word <laughs> bloody, I have to say. Well, we're in the British Library, aren't you? Yeah, know? probably. <laughs> in the very archive. <laughs> but uh, it then makes sense to me that, that, that when, he, when he, uh, he says he and the actors look at you in astonishment when they come off stage, it's because they've realized that in performing the play, the play's full potential has been realized, and you guided them to that into that performance. And clearly that wasn't the case in the first production of the birthday party. You weren't there directing, for one thing. And wasn't there some curiosity about the set, the setting of the first production of yes, the lyrics? Yes, yes, it was totally unreal, which didn't help. In what way was it unreal? Well, it was, um, the designer had a ball. E even there, even in those days, designers were the plague of the English <laughs> theatre. And um, they just, he, he uh, in, created an, a conservatory, a great big conservatory. Um, <coughs> this was supposed to be a little <coughs> uh, boarding house in Eastbourne. And um, I said, where, where does this come from? I remember. And he said, oh, they're all over the place, these conservatories. <laughs> But I was very, very inexperienced in those days, and I didn't really know how to cope. I was, it was my first professional production, and um, it was taken out of my hands, really. But I've never looked back since then. I never allowed it to happen again. No. <laughs> um, Stephen Joseph had, if I'm correct in saying so, had, uh, you'd had some connection with him when you were a student at the Central School. That's right, yeah. So how did it come about that Stephen Joseph wanted to, um, to bring your play up to Scarborough? Well, you better ask him when you can't, because he's dead himself. I don't know. Had you got on well when, you were, when he was a, a tutor, a teacher? He was a drama teacher at Central School, yeah, and I was there briefly. And one day I wrote an essay, and he said to me, um, I'm, supposed to be a young, I'm supposed to be a young actor, and he said to me, why don't you stick to writing? <laughs> I said, well, I probably will. <laughs> he was a very remarkable man, actually. And I think Eightball has done an extraordinary job up there um, at Scarborough. It's wonderful, actually, to continue that tradition. Um, I admire him very much. Well, and he, you, I believe, it's fair to say. So, um, with Henry and your, your team, your comrades in, in Hackney, did you, did you begin going to the theatre uh, in, in London? Joseph Brearley, your English teacher, had nurtured, I know, a, a love of language and of poetry and drama. So when did your theatre-going life really kick off? Uh, when, I was, when I was still at school, uh, Joseph Brearley, my English master, t took us to... Um, Donald Wolfitt's uh, King Lear, which was uh, an eye-opener. And um, he was a, an extraordinary man, this Donald Wolfitt. He was um, a real maverick. He didn't get on with anybody, including me, by the way. Well, you, you joined his company briefly. Oh, yes, in 1953. And one day, I, I was so... Um, uh, I played a knight in King Lear, and um, but I was so excited by his. I saw that production of, of King Lear six times before I joined his company. Um, and I, I suddenly found myself on stage with him. And he was so powerful um, that I started to cough. And out of nerves, out of excitement, I suppose. And I came off stage and walked down a corridor, I always remember this, and, and suddenly his voice said, Pinter! <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, you coughed. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it! <laughs> so, that was... Um, but before that, I'd seen... Before I joined his company, I had been very fortunate to see um, an extraordinary 
uh, collection of actors called about the Golden Generation uh, in, from 1945 to 1950, really, like Laurence Olivier, Ralph Richardson, um, Paul Schofield, Michael Redgrave, um, John Gilbert, and Peggy Ashcroft. And um, they don't make them like that anymore, really. They were, a, they were all doing Shakespeare. And in the main, although I remember seeing Peggy Ashcroft in The Heiress by um, Henry James, I can't remember who direct, uh, adapted it. Uh, and they were wonderful actors, really. I mean, in my view, just jumping ahead, if you like, I think there are some, still some pretty brilliant actors around in the English theatre. But there's only one who um, really, in my opinion, comes up to uh, that level, that stature, and that is Michael Gambon, who, when he feels like it, can really cut the mustard, you know. Mm. Um, he's in my play, No Man's Land, at the moment, in Dublin, which is coming here to London. And, um, but they, they, you don't, I, what can I say? It was, it was an extraordinary generation of actors. And a lot of people learned, learned at their feet. And, um, So w was, was it seeing those shows, presumably at the, the new theatre, some of these shows the were? The new theatre, yeah. Um, I saw um, Henry IV, part one, the new theatre, in about 1945, uh, I think I'm right, or six, with Ralph Richardson as um, Full Star and Laurence Olivier as Hotspur. And um, that was as good as it gets, really. And I also saw Olivier do Oedipus Rex and Gielgud do um, Much Ado About Nothing and so on. And then Schofield, suddenly as a young man, uh, suddenly pops up as Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet. A totally new voice. Um, and what a voice. And what a voice. Uh, that, was, that, that was very exciting. But I have to say that just to get the record absolutely straight, that I didn't go to the theatre all that much nevertheless, because there wasn't much else to see, you know. Right. And I went to the cinema. I spent a great deal of time in the cinema um, in the late 40s. And um, Russian cinema, French cinema, even American cinema. <laughs> um, uh, there were some great American black and white uh, B films of those shows. Very serious ones, too. Uh, and some amazing actors. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So it was a very um, fecund part of my life, if I can use that word. <laughs> it was allowed in the British Library. I <laughs> don't see why not. Um, so You never can tell, you know. <laughs> So that's synthesis. What I, what I feel you're describing in terms of your early uh, awareness of theatre and and so forth. There's a, a synthesis happening between cinema and um, this extraordinary exposure to the immediate post-war golden age of Shakespeare acting, of classical of classical acting. Mm -hmm. But then you began when you began to act yourself. Um, I don't want to overgeneralized, but it, it, it's true, is it not, that you, that you played a lot of plays in rep that weren't terribly good you, yourself. You, you, appear, you, you did a lot of quite ordinary stuff. Oh, yes, yes. Um, but um, but I, before that, I was very fortunate in um, uh, going over to Ireland you know, to, to act in this actor-manager called Annie McMaster. Shakespearean actor manager, his company in 1949-50. And um, I, 
I, I got a, I just answered an advertisement, went to see him, and he said, yes, you can, cigarettes are very cheap. You can get a, a bed and breakfast for not hardly anything. And um, you can play Casio, uh, Horatio, and um, Bassanio, and I'll give you six pounds a week. And I said, well, that's fine with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> how, how old were you at this point? 20. Wow. And then, um, finally, I, I um, did play Iago, actually, to his sort of fellow, which was a hell of an experience. But he did say something to me one day. I was playing Horatio, and he said, oh, we have a convent matinee coming up. He said, on Thursday, I'm exhausted. Why don't you play Hamlet? <laughs> <laughs> and this was um, Tuesday, I think. <laughs> and I said, I'd love to. I, at that age, you know, I knew it anyway. You know, I knew the lines, I mean. So I did play uh, Hamlet, that convent matinee, and I saw him in the wings lurking about. And after the show, he said to me, uh, not bad, dear boy, not bad. Next time, be kinder to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> but there was never a next time. Right. He never invited me to do it again. Right. <clears throat> And he wasn't so exhausted that he didn't stand in the wings keeping a very beady eye on, your, um, right. on your Hamlet. Well, what, that must have been an extraordinary thing to be touring rural Ireland, which was pretty much a, a backward third world country at that time. Yes, it was. It was. Um, what kind of, uh, of, of audiences were you encountering? Oh, terrific. Unforgettable, really. Because it was very primitive. And they responded, I can't say primitively, but they responded actively and spontaneously to Shakespeare. Mm. And um, You mean to the, to the drama, to the high stakes? Yes, and to the language, actually. Mm. Um, it was very exciting for a young man to be there, actually, when I was... 1950, I was 20, then I went back when I was 21. That was about, about it, I think. And then I joined Woolfish, you see, in 53. So, um, it's a long, long history. Mm, that's wonderful, rich. Mm. So, uh, once you've played a lot of Shakespeare with, with McMaster and then with Woolfish, Chronologically, are you then beginning to play more in the, in the regions, in, in repertory theatre? Oh, yes, I was a rep actor for the whole of the 50s. And then I, I wrote the birthday party and the room of the dumb waiter in the meantime. But, um, as you know, the birthday party is a total disaster. But I, um, I then wrote The Caretaker, 1959, I think. And um, that did change my life. Uh, I still acted. I still do do a bit of acting occasionally. Sure. Um, um, it's a very nerve-wracking and demanding activity, actually. actually. <laughs> but I do. In, it's always been very enjoyable, finally. And. Um, I remember when I was playing No Man's Land about whenever it was, about seven years ago, I suppose, at the Almeida, I, and with Paul Eddington, Doug Hodge, Gorn Granger, uh, I had a, I had a fridge and in that fridge, I had a bottle of champagne. And before the show, before the first preview, I came into the dressing room with a glass in my hand. And Douglas Hodge, who's no chump, and knew me pretty quite well anyway, said, what's that? 
I said, they were all drinking tea, by the way. I said, it's a glass of champagne. He said, are you going to drink that before the show? I said, I am. <laughs> and he said, I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I said, look, if you ever find me drunk on stage, let me know, and I will, I will never do it again. He never did find me drunk <laughs> on stage until this very moment. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you once no, I mean, there are various ways of oiling the wheels as an actor. Well, you once told me about how um, you overheard Sir John Gielgud and Sir Ralph just before the beginning of a performance of yes. uh, No, Do you remember that? I do. The, talking of oiling the wheels. Yes, I, I, when they were doing No Man's Land at the National, I happened to be in the wings for some reason or another before the show started. And um, they were stat waiting to go on. And, um, you know, we'd all heard a lot about method acting in those days. And they were, I heard Ralph Richardson say to John Gilbert, where did you have lunch today, old boy? He said, well, the, uh, the room, rooms. What did you have? A very good roast beef. Um, Brussels sprouts, <laughs> oh, certainly beautiful Brussels sprouts. And what about you, Ralph, what did you want? Oh, the ivy, of course. I had um, beautiful, beautiful Dover sole and um, some white burgundy, uh, a Chablis, perfect Chablis. <laughs> and Gilgood said, well, how, how very, very nice. I, I, so glad that you enjoyed it. And the stage manager said, lights are going up and they pulled themselves together, went on stage, and started the play. And they weren't talking about their mothers, their fathers, their, or the fathers or the mothers of the characters, or anything. Mm. They were just talking about roast beef <laughs> and white burgundy, mm. etc. Mm. So that was, that was a point of view I was always very sympathetic to. <laughs> The, the point of view that, that, that actors should act when they go on stage. That's right, I know. Uh, and just not get too worried about any of the rest of it. But this, this golden age that we're talking, that we're reflecting on, uh, and the, the, the beginnings of, of, a, of let's call it, a, a wave of, of new writers, um, a sense of urgent, the need for urgent in, in change, an injection of energy into the stage, into the, the life of the theatre. Do you think that also brought with it developments like method acting? Did, did it bring change that wasn't so uh, beneficial as well? Well, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a, crit not a critic, you know. Um, I'm just a working playwright. So I can't um, theorize. And I, I'm, I'm not a social commentator in that respect. But did you feel part of, of something? What, of a new writing? You mean well, new? I suppose the cliché is the angry young men. No. No, I was always very solitary, actually. I never joined um, uh, anything much. Uh, I, I never, for example, joined the Royal Court, who did have a thriving body of writers, young, new writers. I was never part of that. Um, they still do, by the way, have a body of thriving writers. I mean, what interests me very much these days is that every, uh, every year I'm invited to, the, the Royal Court does a, um, what do they call it? Uh, they invite writers from all over the world, uh, normally between 12 and 20 to come and participate in a, not a conference, it's more than that, it's a work. Oh, a, a workshop. Okay. Yeah, workshop. And um, I speak to these, I come and, I, I don't just speak, we have a conversation. And um, I did it again only the other day, actually. And it is really quite invigorating to meet writers 
from, uh, these are not children, by the way, they're all working, mature playwrights. But to meet people from um, um, China, India, Cuba, um, anywhere you can think of, actually. Who, to meet, they meet for the first time, and they share their own experiences, their own perceptions of how they see life most specifically in their own countries and generally in the world. And um, I find it really, uh, really quite illuminating. And in, what if you like inspiring that you have these, there are writers all over the damn place and they insist upon writing. Hmm. They don't stop, which is um, very heartening and invigorating. And um, what are they writing about? As I say, they're writing about their own countries, their own lives, um, and the world. What else? You know. I've never, uh, I mean, I, I don't know these people, but I get the sense that they're as that the imagination has really got them by the throat, their own imaginations, and as it did me a um, long time ago. And, um, and they seem to know that too. They, they, they know my work, and um, And I know them. And, that. I, and I doubt that some of them are experiencing uh, or have experienced attempts by others to repress and oppress their freedom to write. Well, yes, well, you've got that happening all over the bloody place. Um, so I think we have a very not only freedom to write, but freedom to express their views. Um, I'm not, not just talking about them, I'm talking about us. I mean, the fact is that this may not be quite on the, the brief you, you have this evening, but We've if there is such a We've left the brief. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've been really struck by the flabbergasting, uh, breathtaking hypocrisy uh, recently of the moral stance the USA and this country has taken about the Russian invasion of Georgia. Um, you actually hear people like Bush, Brown, Miliband, and I'm sure Blair, if he can still speak, um, <laughs> taking a moral position, saying, how can you uh, invade a sovereign country? A what? <laughs> I think it's so blatant and so it stinks to high heaven, actually. And what I'd like to see is if there a front page headline saying, uh, can we remind the Prime Minister that we invaded Iraq in, in, in 2003? Is it possible? Or have we simply forgotten? Mm. I mean, only a hundredth, only a, a, million, a million people have died in Iraq, including hundreds of thousands of children. Not entirely, not directly, all of them from our actions, but we're responsible for that state of affairs. Mm. And it's put on the back burner. It's almost um, as if it's never happened. But how is it? We are responsible. This is a question that I wanted to ask you. What is the... the the appropriate, appropriate response of an individual who, who feels compelled to, to try to take responsibility for what has been done by our government? Well, to say so for a start, to speak, the appropriate response is simply to look for the truth and tell it. That's my view. I have to say that's what I try to do. Hmm. And um, although it's... Um, 
getting late in the day, in my life, I mean, I will continue to do, do so. And I think that is the, 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 I'm not alone in this by a long, long way. I mean, there are, there are millions all over the people of, all over the world who feel the strongest possible objection to the actions taken in their name, such, uh, such actions. Um, and the, the hypocrisy. Mm. I find it pretty sickening, actually. Mm. So. I, I, one thinks of, I think of uh, Stanley towards the end of the birthday party being led away, having had his uh, ability to speak out uh, removed. That's right. And um, Petey saying, don't let them tell you what to do, Stan. That's right. Um, but it seems to get harder and harder to, to get that message, if it is a message, and I don't think it is a message in your play, but to communicate that idea to people when there are so many other influences putting people to sleep at the same time as, as others, artists, writers, are saying, wake up. Well, I think you're dead right. Well, I know I'm right, but what do we do about it? <laughs> um, we do our very best to well, keep it right there. You, you know, know I, I, this, this idea of, of people trying to keep... Do you know what these are? No. They're the, they're, they're, these are readers' reports from the Lord Chamberlain's office. I'm just, uh, I brought them, two of them with me on stage because they're so delicious. Uh, in terms of the idea of, of people trying to repress the truth mm. or, or stop audiences from, hear, from being allowed to respond to an artist's uh, voice, the reader's report of the birthday party, 24th of the fourth month, 1958, begins an insane, pointless play. <laughs> Mr. Pinter has jumbled all the tricks of Beckett and UNESCO with a dash from all the recently produced plays at the Royal Court, plus a fashionable flavouring of blasphemy. <gasps> the result is still silly. I mean, these, these are extraordinary documents. This, uh, there is a constant need for vigilance against um, people wanting to silence the voice of... Uh, of what? what as, as a writer, what, what were you... When you decided to take writing into your own hands and not be in, in rep... Uh, churning out um, rubbish. What was the, the primary instinct in terms of the audience? <coughs> well, I think it's quite complicated. I, was a, I wrote poetry at the age, from the age of 11, and I didn't ask anybody what they thought of it. I just wrote it. Um, and that's always been my, uh, where I stand. I don't ask anybody what they think about it what I do. I just do it. Um, so that nothing has changed, actually. Uh, and I, and I still write poetry. And I still, it speaks for itself. And I don't ask anybody's permission. And, um, but occasionally I do run into interesting things. I wrote a poem which I can't quote simply at the moment because I simply can't remember it uh, properly. But I wrote a poem about a few months ago which I sent to The Guardian and it, it actually contained some obscene language. And The Guardian wrote back to me and said, we can't, we're not able to publish this poem because we feel it will anger our readers. <laughs> And I thought, what? <laughs> and I said to myself, all you've done are two things, really. You've angered me. <laughs> and I shall never send you another poem again. Which is the case. So, listen, um, I'm ready for a drink, actually. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't gainsay that. Would you... Finish by reading one of your poems. I have a book of poems here. I, I know that you began poetry, because you told me once, you began writing poetry when you, uh, and, and showed a poem to your father, and it was a love poem. Yes. Um, and not everybody knows your love poetry. 
Well, I'll read one. And I wonder whether you would read the poem on the right-hand side of that page. That's exactly the one I was thinking what of. What an extraordinary <laughs> thing. The fact is, my father was a pretty authoritarian man. I, he was a great fellow. But he used to go to work. He was a tailor. And he got up very, very early. And one day, he came down to the kitchen and found me sitting at the table about 6 o'clock in the morning. And um, I was writing. And he said, what are you doing? What are you doing up at this time of the morning? I said, I'm writing. Writing what, he said. He picked the, the piece of paper up. He looked at it. He said, all right, go on. But then he went to work, and I continued to write. Um, you know, when I said, this is the poem I would like to read, which he just offered me, that's true. And it's called, um, It Is Here for A. What sound was that? I turn away into the shaking room. What was that sound that came in on the dark? What is this maze of light it leaves us in? What is this stance we take to turn away and then turn back? What did we hear? It was the breath we took when we first met. Listen, it is here. Harold, thank you very much. I've got to say one. I've got to say one thing about the. Give me a hand. All right. I, I, I'm most grateful to to Harold, and I have to tell you that there's a drink out here. Please come through and uh, and imbibe. Thank you. You've been listening to a British Library podcast. For more information, visit www.bl.uk forward slash podcast.